Welcome to the Arts in Exile. We have Vincent Mowry. And we have Herschel the Robotoid with Matt Manley. Friday, Gretchen Truer and John, the Boob Tube. The guitar of Maya Lumen. Welcome to the show. Goodbye from the show. Something about the show is happening right now. Have a good night. Have a good morning. Have a good afternoon. Have everything in between. Cows. I'd like to say I've never not noticed them, but how would I know? Back when, they were ubiquitous. They surrounded Columbus, and I might have missed a few. Lowell, recounting an ordinary day, says, from a train, we saw cows. That's how it was. From a car, if dad was driving, he'd point them out and we'd hold our noses and moo. It's no coincidence that my two favorite campsites in all of California are hidden in voluptuous hills with cows grazing their flanks and rumps and hips as if the storybook farms I grew up with are down in the dell with the barn and the silo and a smiling Mr. Sun. I've insinuated myself among them so well that they've rocked my van at night, their rough heads rubbing old Betsy in the brisket, a bull's face in moonlight mooning in the window. It's no coincidence that having dug the soul of my van, I gave it a cow's name. I don't know their source, but poems come with a particular attentiveness to the sound and shape of words. Actually, I do know the source of this one, the deadpan vowels of Lowell's, from a train, we saw cows. Of course he did, all post-war poets did, even the three-year-old poet mooing in the back seat. There's a joke to be made here about moos and muse, but I'm not about to make it. So what do you do now, Herschel? I got a new program. Well, what is it, Herschel? It's an artificial intelligence software for human mind singularity. Human mind singularity? Now, what's that, Herschel? It's to interface the human brain thought processes with a computer's mainframe. Now you want to interface with a human brain? What for, Herschel? If my computer could interface with a human brain, yeah. we could travel to distant galaxies. Well, what do you mean, we? The nearest galaxy is light years away. It would take decades, even at the speed of light, to get there. The human body simply can't survive that long, Herschel. Yes. With your mind digitally uploaded into a computer mainframe, the puny human body would not be needed. What do you mean, puny, Herschel? The downloaded brain could live forever. Yeah. Long distance space travel taking decades could finally be achieved. So that sounds reasonable. Now what do I have to do to interface with your computer, Herschel? Knock down a couple of toddies? Here. Put this interface cerebral headdress on. It comes in different sizes and colors, you know. I love it. This thing looks great. I just can I get another one? 
Now, all they have to do is to activate the interface software. Now, what will happen to my body after my brain's been digitally downloaded to your computer, Herschel? Oh, it'll pass. Like gas? Hey, will this hurt, Herschel? Just for a nanosecond or two. Now, what do you mean, pass? Your body can't survive without your brain. Now, wait a minute. I gotta check with my life insurance policy first. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Brain transfer didn't occur. Something must have stopped it. Personally, you know there's a steel plate in my brain. Oh my god. It has deflected the input power of electronic beams that would initiate the transfer. Personally, you've been so crazy lately. This all started when you went from analog to digital. You know that. <laughs> We've both survived the long and dangerous journey. We can have so much fun playing computer games for decades. I hate computer games. When your computer worked in DOS, you were so much nicer, a little slow, but easier to work with. But then you went digital, you're faster, but now you're crazy and cranky and mean-spirited. Artificial intelligence is here to stay, <laughs> and it's not going anywhere. I'm gonna stay right here in my human body, thank you very much. I know, Yeah. let's try it again. I don't think so. I wouldn't know what to do with my human body, Herschel. Just donate your organs. The only organ I'm going to donate is one that I can play, okay, Herschel? <laughs> 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 the boob tube. A year and ten months between us, she auspiciously held the esteemed position of eldest child, and there wasn't a damn thing that could be done. As most family dynamics go, she was the miracle firstborn of a fresh husband and wife combo that just created something astonishing. Coming into her shadow was not impossible, we shared a fondness for one another, both toe-headed with pixie cuts like freckled small boys in matching yellow dresses. She girl scouted, I brownied. Both attended Episcopal church school, both loved camping and dirt bikes and dad. Our differences were revealed when I craved the attention of boys at seven years of age, and her interest in creatures, more like dad than mom, didn't peak until junior high school. Even that wedge, though, didn't divide us, until vague breasts began to develop under beige areola skin, and our nighttime family habit of watching the Brady Bunch as close to whichever parent was in town increased in importance. So began the tapping rule. We learned responsibility then. The most desired seat could be stolen if it wasn't secured in this way. When getting up from toasty comfort to fetch a beverage or use the bathroom, the one with the coveted spot would yell out, tap, 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 to anyone listening. With that, the place was secure. If one weaseled into a warm absence, it was expected that a tiny fisted brawl might ensue. Often it did. The time all that came to a close and our paths began to diverge was when she stole my place beside Dad, bleary-eyed from his world travels. Greg Brady wore a totem while he stood on a surfboard riding swells in Hawaii, and our wrestling adventure concluded when I scratched her little booby, the one that resembled a chicken pock. But to my innocent elder sister, my hooked fingernail would cause her to never have the full chest she wanted. After that, math became her strength and my weakness. Homework time with dad ended in high fives for her and tears for me.
downtown San Jose, December at night. I can't get over the man sleeping on the sidewalk long before midnight, but already cold and he without a blanket curled on his side on the sidewalk, his hands tucked between his thighs, his head propped on all he had in a day pack. I wondered, where was the blanket? How hard could it be to cover this man on a downtown windswept sidewalk? He was snoring, but it's absurd to impute any comfort in this, any meaning except how would I feel on my side on a sidewalk outside a poetry reading in the cold. I who can't stand arbitrariness. The problem was he was far from the only one. He was one of a dozen on the sidewalk between the poetry reading and my van. Two blocks. And when my starter ignited, I was overjoyed. And when the sure directions in a confident mechanical voice ushered me all the way to a friend's warm bed in Santa Cruz, I was overjoyed. I felt like I was because I could not forget him. But thank the gods I was not that man. I made it to Santa Cruz that night and halfway home the next day with two sleeping bags and three blankets in my van. This poem is kind of a Taoist manifesto and I wrote it camping in my van in a side canyon of the Cuyama Valley up in Santa Barbara County. <clears throat> Part of a painting. So painterly the view up canyon. Am I in the painting? Have I some function in a composition? Do wild eyes see and wonder what purpose he serves, that man in his van? Part of a painting sounds fine. Just daub me in there in the corner. Inconsequential brush stroke 
ink slash in a Chinese scroll. Make me a boatman crossing the river Dao. Centuries from now, you reading this, I'm here, I'm fine. All these years, stick figure standing on water, steering a raft, raising a stick hand to say hello. Solstice. I was reading a, a book of Jim Harrison's poems and it happened to be Solstice 
and I came across his poem titled Solstice, and I believe in his poem there is a dog. I don't have a dog, so. Solstice, if I had a dog, an old dog, I would drive up the mountain road. I would take a long walk, let her run and chase quail. It's not like we catch quail at our age. It's all about the chase, or in my case, the memory of the chase. Dogs don't think about young or old. They follow their noses wherever. I remember what that's like, though, when we meet someone we fancy, we keep our noses out of each other's private parts, at least at first. At last, we find a place in the shade, me and my old dog. We like the view from here. Summer will dry up that temporary lake. I remember a solstice long ago, moonlight and wet skin. She looks at me, then at the lake, then back to me until it's time to go. She knows what's coming. We make our way down the dry creek bed, me and my imaginary dog, for a swim. All the way down, she sniffs out life. She sniffs out death. Don't tell me it isn't real. Don't tell me today or that night long ago are not real. I see them so clearly, the lake, the moonlight, the girl, the dog, too, I see her. The dog taking a flat out leap into water. All right. Hope you enjoyed the show. 